come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess of the task force at any time. Without objection, members of the full committee not on this task force are authorized to participate in today's hearing. As a reminder, I ask all members to keep themselves muted when they are not being recognized. The staff has been instructed not to mute members except when a member is not being recognized and there is inadvertent background noise. Members are reminded that they may only participate in one remote proceeding at a time. If you are not participating today, please keep your camera on. And if you choose to attend a different remote proceeding, please turn your camera off. This hearing is entitled Equitable Algorithms, How Human-Centered AI Can Address Systemic Racism and Racial Justice in Housing and Financial Services. I now recognize myself for four minutes to give an opening statement. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today uh, for what should be a very interesting discussion. We have a great panel of witnesses that I know will provide some stimulating and thought-provoking points of view. Today, we are here to explore how AI can be used to increase racial, racial equity in housing and financial services. There's been extensive discussion around this topic, mostly focusing on the real problems that can occur when we use AI that can inherently or unknowingly be biased. I think that a lot of these issues uh, can be more complicated and nuanced uh, than how they're portrayed in the media, uh, but it's clear that the use of AI is hitting a nerve with a lot of folks, um, and that concern is for a good cause. No one should be denied the opportunity to own a home, a pillar of the American dream because of a non-human, automated, and awful, unlawfully discriminatory decision. Regulators and policymakers have a big responsibility here too. We must actively engage in these sorts of discussions to determine what the best practices are and to enact laws that reflect and encourage those practices while also fostering innovation and improvements. Ideally, we should get to a space where AI is not only compliant with and meeting the standards that we have set for fairness, but exceeding those standards. It should be a tool that augments and automates fairness not something that we have to babysit to make sure that is still meeting our standards. The real promise of AI in this space is that it may eventually produce greater fairness and equity in ways that we may not have contemplated ourselves. So we wanna make sure that the biases of the analog world are not repeated in the AI and machine learning world. I'm excited to have this conversation to see how we can make AI be the best version of itself and how to design algorithmic models to best capture the ideals of fairness and transparency that are reflected in our fair lending laws. Uh, thank you all again for being part of this important discussion. And the chair will now recognize the ranking member for five minutes for an opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Foster. Uh, first of all, I, I wanna say how pleased I am to work with you as, as I take on the role as a of ranking member of, of this important task force. They've always shown a great willingness to be a thoughtful bipartisan partner, uh, and I look forward to continuing our work together. Uh, I also wanna thank ranking member McHenry, ranking member of the full committee, uh, for putting his trust in me to lead on this task force. Uh, he's been a, a tremendous mentor to me and, and a thought leader in policies that promote and expand the use of innovative technologies. Uh, financial services is an industry that continues to be on the cutting edge of technology as evident through the use of AI and other emerging technologies. I believe that this committee and particularly this task force should embrace this innovation and continue to consider ways that Congress can provide helpful clarity to industry without stifling innovation. Technology can help to not only propel forward our advancements in the financial services industry, but also can foster further inclusion and opportunities to our unbanked and underbanked communities. Advanced credit decision models can use AI to improve the confidence of lenders in extending credit, reducing defaults, and finding data that is not readily available for traditional assessments of creditworthiness. Additionally, it is my belief that AI technologies can provide federal regulators additional oversight tools to reduce and prevent financial crimes. We should be encouraging federal agencies to be working more with the industry in a way that fosters adoption and can insist in anti-money laundering efforts. On top of using AI to catch bad actors, federal entities should take steps to work with industry to further adopt the use of artificial intelligence through the use of reg tech in order to help automate and streamline regulatory compliance. Today's hearing is an important one. We're having an important discussion about some of the challenges the industry faces by employing this technology, specifically on bias and algorithms. 
I believe these discussions are important to have. We must acknowledge and recognize these technologies at times are not perfect due to the inherent nature of a technology created by humans. It is vital though that we do not take steps backwards by over-regulating this industry, which may have a chilling effect on the deployment of these technologies. Instead, my hope is that we will continue to work with the experts in industry in order to move forward in a bipartisan way that both celebrates the technological advancements and ensures that there is transparency and fairness through the use of artificial intelligence. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today about the importance of this technology in the financial services sector and how Congress can act to encourage innovation and promote fairness. And with that, I yield back. Thank you. And the chair will now recognize the chairwoman of the full committee, the gentlewoman from California for one minute. There we are. Thank you so very much, Mr. Foster. I am so delighted and excited about artificial intelligence. And I'm very pleased that you chose to provide the leadership for this committee that will help us to understand how we can get rid of bias uh, in lending and other efforts uh, that should be made uh, throughout our society, uh, dealing with simply fairness and justice. I am very pleased, and I think that our committee uh, will provide the leadership in the Congress of the United States uh, for dealing with this issue. As a matter of fact, we created a subcommittee on diversity and inclusion, and your subcommittee, or your committee, or rather, uh, on artificial intelligence works very well uh, with that committee, that subcommittee, uh, because actually you are going down the same paths, looking at the same issues and dealing with what we can do to get rid of injustice and unfairness. Thank you so very much. And please go forward. And you're the one to do it. Thank you very much. I shield, yield back. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, today, we welcome the testimony of our distinguished witnesses. First, we have Stephen Hayes, who is a partner at Roman Colpax PLLC. Next, we have Melissa Koide, the CEO of FinRag Lab. Next, we have Lisa Rice, the president and CEO of the National Fair Housing Alliance. Next, we have Karim Saleh, the, who is the founder of Fair Play AI. And finally, we have Dave Gerard, who is the founder and CEO of Upstart. Witnesses are reminded that their oral testimony will be limited to five minutes. You should be able to see a timer on your screen that will indicate how much time you have left and a chime will go off at the end of your time. I'd ask you to be mindful of the timer and quickly wrap up your testimony if you hear the chime so we can be respectful of both the witnesses and the committee members time. Without objection, your full written statement will be made part of the record. Uh, Mr. Hayes, you are now recognized for five minutes to give an oral presentation of your testimony. Chairwoman Waters, Chairman Foster, Ranking Member Gonzalez, and members of the task force, thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify. My name is Stephen Hayes, and I'm a partner at Realm and Colfax, a civil rights law firm. We have a litigation practice focused on combating discrimination in housing and lending. We also provide legal counsel to entities, including counsel on testing algorithms for discrimination risks. I previously worked at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Credit markets reflect our nation's history of discrimination. There are stark gaps in credit access and disparities in credit scoring and in populations with thin or no credit histories. There's evidence that some alternative data and AI-based machine learning models or ML models can help lenders make credit decisions for these groups and so have the potential to expand access. Whether that's true in practice and whether any increases will improve or exacerbate disparities is a context specific question. The use of alternative data and alternative models can also raise serious risks related to explainability, validity, and of course, discrimination. ACOA and the Fair Housing Act prohibit lending and housing discrimination. They prohibit intentional discrimination, sometimes called disparate treatment, as well as an unintentional type of discrimination called disparate impact. Disparate impact focuses on fair outcomes. Unlawful disparate impact occurs when, one, a policy disproportionately harms members of a protected class, and two, either 
the policy does not advance a legitimate interest, or three, there's a less discriminatory way to serve that interest. And what that means in practice is that entities should not adopt policies like models that unnecessarily cause disparities. These frameworks, in particular disparate impacts, translate well to lending models, including to ML models. Some banks have been testing models for discrimination for years. And of course, disparities remain in credit markets and model fairness alone is not gonna solve that problem. But these programs demonstrate that discrimination testing is possible and it can be effective. As a general matter, the best programs align with legal principles. So first, disparate treatment. The programs ensure that models don't include protected classes or proxies as variables, and that the models are accurate across groups, which is important, but it's insufficient to eliminate discrimination. Second, the programs include a disparate impact assessment using the three-step framework that I mentioned before. The final step in that framework minimizing the disparities caused by models is key to this process. In the case of traditional models, this involves substituting variables in the models with the goal of identifying variations of models that maintain performance, but that have less disparate impact. And newer methods exist now that can improve upon that process for ML models. Disparate impact testing can benefit businesses and consumers. It can create more representative training samples and increases in access to credit over time. It can also counteract the legacies of historic and of existing discrimination. These tests are also paired with more holistic measures like fair lending training for modelers, ensuring teams have diverse backgrounds, reviewing policies within which models operate and monitoring areas of discretion. Finally, banks are expected to comply with agency model risk guidance, which is meant to help mitigate safety and soundness risks. And these principles are not focused on discrimination, but they can help facilitate discrimination testing because they create an audit trail for models and they help establish monitoring systems for models. In my experience, many companies understand that models can perpetuate discrimination and they don't want to use discriminatory models. But at the same time, discrimination testing is very uneven and oftentimes non-existent, which is the result of legal and structural background characteristics that incentivize testing in some areas, but not in others. Policymakers can take steps to ensure more uniform and effective testing. First, agencies like the CFPB can routinely test models for discrimination, including assessing whether less discriminatory models exist. Second, Agencies should announce the methodologies that they use to test models, and they should encourage adoption of discrimination-specific model risk principles. And third, agencies should clarify that discrimination, including unnecessary disparate impact, is illegal across markets outside of traditional areas like credit and housing. Thank you for considering my testimony today. Thank you. And I will now um, turn it over to Ms. Koide. You are now recognized for five minutes. Thank you so much, uh, Chairman Foster. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Chairman Waters, Ranking Member McHenry, and the entire AI Task Force and Ranking Member Gonzalez. My name is Melissa Koide, and I am the founder and CEO of FinReg Lab. FinReg Lab is a nonprofit research organization evaluating the use of new technologies and data in financial services to drive greater financial inclusion. FinReg Lab has focused on the use of alternative financial data and machine learning algorithms in credit underwriting because credit not only helps bridge short term gaps, but it is critical for enabling longer term investments for families in homes, education, and small business. The credit system, as we all realize, reflects and influences the ability of families and small businesses to participate in the broader economy. Yet, I think we also realize that about 20% of US adults in the US lack a sufficient credit history to be scored under the most widely used models. Another 30% have struggled to access affordable credit because their scores were non-prime. Communities of color and low-income populations are substantially more likely to be affected. Nearly 30% of African-Americans and Hispanics 
cannot be scored under traditional means compared to 16% of whites and Asians. Our work at FinReg Lab directly intersects with the task force's inquiry into ways to safely harness the power of AI and data to increase opportunity, equity, and inclusiveness. FinReg Lab's first empirical research evaluated cash flow data as a means to risk assess underserved people and small businesses for credit. We found cash flow data has substantial potential to increase credit inclusion. Our latest project launched last month focuses on machine learning algorithms and their use in credit underwriting. We are empirically evaluating the capability and performance of diagnostic tools that seek to explain machine learning underwriting models with respect to reliability, fairness, and transparency. Financial services providers have begun using machine learning models in a variety of contexts because of the potential to increase the prediction accuracy. There are many ways AI and machine learning may be beneficial for consumers and small businesses, but the technology could also be transformational where information gaps and other obstacles currently heighten the cost and risks of serving particular populations. Yet we all realize that the complexity of AI and machine learning models can make it harder to understand and manage, and there is important concerns around exacerbating historical disparities, as well as flaws in the underlying data. Publicly available research is limited, but what's there supports the general predictiveness benefits of machine learning, yet it also suggests the effects of fairness and inclusion may vary depending upon, and this is important, the underlying data used. Some sources suggest it can increase inclusion when used to analyze traditional credit bureau data, while other studies find mixed or even negative effects uh, when absent of supplemental data sources used. For this reason, we believe more research is needed to better understand the effect of machine learning alone and in conjunction with promising types of financial data. So what's happening in the market today? Some banks and non-banks are beginning to use machine learning algorithms directly in their underwriting models in order to evaluate applications for credit cards, personal, auto, and small business loans. They're doing so to improve the credit risk accuracy, to leverage the speed and efficiency of the technology, and to keep up with competitors. Yet, while interest in machine learning is increasing, there are fundamental questions about the ability to diagnose and manage these models in light of both general concerns about reliability, transparency, and fairness, and specific federal regulatory requirements that Steve just discussed. FinReg Lab is therefore partnering with researchers from the Stanford Graduate School of Business to evaluate the performance and the capabilities of explainability tools designed to help lenders develop and manage machine learning algorithms in credit underwriting. We will use the federal requirements concerning risk model governance, fair lending, and adverse action disclosures as a starting point, but expect that our research may be useful to address broader questions about machine learning reliability and the use of diagnostic tools for managing algorithmic decisions in a range of contexts. In addition to focusing on the machine learning explainability, we intend to continue to study the ro role of alternative financial data both alone and in conjunction with AI and machine learning to foster greater. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Koide. Uh, Ms. Rice, you are now recognized for five minutes to give an oral presentation of your testimony. Chairman Foster, Ranking Member Gonzalez, and members of the task force, thank you so much for inviting me to testify at today's hearing. The National Fair Housing Alliance is the country's only national civil rights agency dedicated solely to eliminating all forms of housing and lending discrimination. And this includes eliminating bias in algorithmic based systems used in housing and financial services through our recently launched tech equity initiative. How AI systems are designed, the data used to build them, the subjective renderings applied by the scientists creating the models and other issues can cause discrimination, create or further entrench structural inequality and deny people critical opportunities. On the other hand, innovations in the area of artificial intelligence have the potential to reduce discriminatory outcomes and help millions of people. 
much as scientists use the coronavirus to develop life-saving vaccines, we can use AI to de detect, diagnose, and cure harmful technologies that are extremely detrimental to people and communities. We have biased AI systems because the data used to build the models is deeply flawed. Technicians developing the systems are not educated about how technology can render discriminatory outcomes and regulators are not equipped to sufficiently handle the myriad manifestations of bias generated by the technologies we use in financial services and housing. Let's start with the data. The building blocks for algorithmic tools are tainted data that is embedded with bias generated from centuries of discrimination. Not only are we building systems with biased data, oftentimes data sets are under-inclusive and not representative of underserved groups. As a result, for example, traditional credit scoring systems, as you just heard Melissa say, uh, oftentimes cannot see the behavior of consumers that are not represented in the data. This is why communities of color are disproportionately credit invisible or inaccurately scored. For example, in Detroit, Michigan, almost 40% of black adults are credit invisible. This pattern is common throughout our nation. So how do these consumers access quality credit opportunities, rent apartments, obtain affordable insurance, or access other important opportunities necessary for people to lead productive lives. But technology does not have to be biased. There are mechanisms for producing fairer systems, and I'll mention just a few. One method of debiasing tech is to integrate the review of racial and other forms of bias into every phase of the algorithm's life cycle, including data selection, development, deployment, and monitoring. The European Union's newly proposed regulation for AI offers one way of addressing this issue. It creates a risk-based framework that considers technologies like credit scoring as a high-risk category because of the grave impact it has on people's lives. The proposal holds high-risk models to a higher standard and incorporates a review for discrimination risk in all aspects of the model's life cycle. To help debias tech, all AI stakeholders, including regulators, scientists, engineers, and more, should be trained on fair housing and fair lending issues. Trained professionals are better able to identify red flags and design solutions for debiasing tech. In fact, recent innovations in building fair tech have come from AI experts trained on issues of fairness. Increasing diversity will also lead to better outcomes for consumers. Research shows that diverse teams are more innovative and productive. Moreover, in several instances, it has been people of color working in the field who were able to identify potentially discriminatory AI systems. I will close by calling out the need for the creation of a publicly available data set to be used for research and educational purposes. Congress should encourage the release of more loan level data from the National Mortgage Survey and the National Mortgage Databases so researchers, advocacy groups, and the public can study bias in housing and finance markets, and in particular, as it may relate to AI systems. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you, Ms. Rice. Uh, Mr. Saleh, you are now recognized for five minutes. Oops, and I believe you'll have to unmute. Forgive me. Thank you, Chair Waters, Ch Chair Foster, Ranking Member Gonzalez, and other members of the task force for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Kareem Saleh, and I am the founder and CEO of Fair Play, the world's first fairness as a service company. I have witnessed firsthand the extraordinary potential of AI algorithms to increase access to credit and opportunity but I have also seen the risks these algorithms pose to many Americans. If we are to fully harness the benefits of AI, we must commit to building infrastructure that embeds fairness in every step of the algorithmic decisioning process. Despite the passage of the fair lending laws almost 50 years ago, people of color and other historically underprivileged groups 
are still denied loans at an alarming rate. The result is a persistent wealth gap and fewer opportunities for minority families and communities to create a prosperous future. Why are we still so deeply unfair? The truth is, the current methods of bias detection and lending are completely unsuited to the AI era. Even though lending has become AI powered and automated, fair lending compliance is stuck in the analog past. So how can we bring fair lending compliance into the 21st century? We must give lenders the tools and guidance they need to increase fairness without putting their businesses at risk. Today, lenders are required to measure and remediate bias in their credit decisioning systems. If say black applicants are approved at materially lower rates than white applicants, lenders must evaluate whether this disparity is justified by a business necessity or determine whether the lender's objectives could be met by a less discriminatory alternative. It is at this stage the search for alternatives and the invocation of business justifications where our current fair lending system has the greatest potential to evolve. The way most lenders search for less discriminatory models involves taking credit scores out of an algorithm, rerunning it, and evaluating the differences in outcomes for protected groups. This method almost always results in a fairer model, but also a less profitable one. This puts lenders in a catch and a catch-22. They'd like to be fair, but they'd also like to stay in business. Plus, there is no guidance on what constitutes an appropriate trade-off between profitability and fairness, creating uncertainty for lenders about how to meet regulatory requirements. Worse still, lenders fear that the very act of trying to find a fairer, better means of underwriting or pricing loans could be used against them, as evidence they knew their algorithms were biased to begin with. Faced with this problem, most lenders opt for safety, writing explanations for the use of an unfair model instead of searching for alternatives that may yield fairer results. The upshot is that fair lending compliance has become an exercise in justifying unfairness rather than an opportunity to increase inclusion. Today, a better, fairer option exists. Using AI fairness tools to debias algorithms without sacrificing profitability. Several AI techniques allow lenders to take a variable like credit score and disentangle its predictive power from its disparity driving effects. In many instances, these AI fairness tools have increased approval rates for protected groups anywhere from 10 to 30% without increasing risk. Of course, industry will need support in order to fully embrace the benefits of AI fairness. Here, Congress and regulators can play an important role by ensuring that fairness testing is being done by more lenders, more often applied to their underwriting, pricing, marketing, and collections models, and includes a robust search for less discriminatory alternatives. In addition, policymakers should ease the fear of liability for lenders who commit to thoroughly searching for disparities and less discriminatory alternatives to reward rather than punish those who proactively look for fairer systems. Regulators can provide guidance on how lenders should view the trade-offs between profitability and fairness and set expectations for what lenders should do if disparities are identified. To bring fairness to AI decisions, we must build the fairness infrastructure of the future, not justify the discrimination of the past. Using AI debiasing tools, we can embed fairness into the algorithmic decisions to promote opportunity for all Americans while allowing financial institutions to reap the rewards of a safe and inclusive approach. If we prioritize fairness, the machines we build will follow. Thank you, I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Mr. Saleh. Um, Mr. Gerard, you are now recognized for five minutes uh, for to give us an oral presentation of your testimony. Madam Chair Waters, Chairman Foster, Ranking Member Gonzalez, and members of the Task Force on Artificial Intelligence, Thank you for the opportunity to participate in today's conversation. My name is Dave Girard, co-founder and CEO of Upstart, a leading artificial intelligence lending platform headquartered in San Mateo, California and Columbus, Ohio. I founded Upstart more than nine years ago in order to improve access to affordable credit through the application of modern technology and data science. In the last seven years, our bank and credit union partners have originated more than $9 billion in high quality consumer loans using our technology about half of which were made to low and moderate income borrowers. 
Our AI-based system combines billions of cells of training data with machine learning algorithms to more accurately determine an applicant's credit worthiness. As a company entirely focused on improving access to affordable credit for the American consumer, fairness and inclusiveness are issues we care about deeply. The opportunity for AI-based lending to improve access to credit for the American consumer is dramatic, but equally dramatic is the opportunity to reduce disparities and inequities that exists in the traditional credit scoring system. In the early days at Upstart, we conducted a retroactive study with a large credit bureau and we uncovered a jarring pair of statistics. Just 45% of Americans have access to bank quality credit, yet 83% of Americans have never actually defaulted on a loan. That's not what we would call fair lending. The FICO score was introduced in 1989 and has since become the default way banks judge a loan applicant. But in reality, FICO is extremely limited in its ability to predict credit performance because it's narrow in scope and inherently backward looking. And as consumer protection groups such as the National Consumer Law Center have highlighted, for the past two decades, study after study have found that African-American and Latino communities have lower credit scores as a group than white borrowers. At Upstart, we use modern technology and data science to find more ways to prove that consumers are indeed credit worthy to bridge that 45% versus 83% gap. We believe that consumers are more than their credit scores and by going beyond the FICO score and including a wide variety of other information such as a consumer's employment history and educational background, we've built a significantly more accurate and inclusive credit model. While most people believe a more accurate credit model means saying no to more applicants, the truth is just the opposite. Accurately identifying the small fraction of borrowers who are unlikely to be able to repay a loan is a better outcome for everyone. It leads to significantly higher approval rates and lower interest rates than a traditional model, especially for underserved demographic groups such as Black and Hispanic applicants. Since our early days, skeptics have asked whether AI models would hold up in a down economy. The tragedy of the COVID pandemic where unemployment rose from 4% to more than 14% in just a few weeks required that we prove our mettle. And in fact, we did just that. Despite the elevate, elevated le level of unemployment, the pandemic had no material impact on the performance of upstart powered loans held by our bank partners. With the support of a more accurate credit model powered by AI, our bank and credit union partners can have the confidence to lend regardless of the state of the economy. Just imagine banks lending consistently and responsibly just when credit is needed most. That's an outcome for which we can all cheer. The concern that AI and credit decisioning could replicate or even amplify human bias is well-founded. We've understood since our inception that strong consumer protection laws, including the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, help ensure that good intentions are actually matched by good outcomes. This is especially true when it comes to algorithmic lending. For these reasons and more, we proactively met with the appropriate regulator the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau well before launching our company. Quite simply, we decided to put independent human oversight into the equation after significant good faith efforts starting in 2015 between Upstart and the CFPB to determine the proper way to measure bias in AI models. We demonstrated that our AI driven model doesn't result in unlawful disparate impact against protected classes of consumers. Because AI models change and improve over time, we developed automated tests with the regulator's input to test every single applicant on our platform for bias. And we provide the results of these tests to the Bureau on a quarterly basis. In September, 2017, we received the first no action letter from the CFPB recognizing that Upstart's platform improves access to affordable credit without introducing unlawful bias. Thus far, we've been able to report to the CFPB that our AI-based system has significantly improved access to credit. Specifically, the Upstart model approves 32% more consumers and, and lowers interest rates by almost three and a half percentage points compared to a traditional model. For near top prime consumers, our model approves 86% more consumers and reduces their interest rates by more than five percentage points compared to a traditional model. Upstart's model also provides approval rates and lower interest rates for every traditionally underserved demographic. For example, over the last three years, the Upstart model helped that banks that use Upstart approve 34% more black borrowers than a traditional model would have with a four percentage point lower interest rates. That's the type of consumer benefit we should all get excited about. I apologize I'm running long, so I'll be happy to just cut it here if that would be uh, what the, what, 
that the community would prefer. Well, thank you, Mr. Gerard, for your, your testimony. And the chair will now recognize himself for five minutes for, for some questions. One big prerequisite to racial and gender equity is socioeconomic integration. Minorities of traditionally and, and traditionally disenfranchised individuals should have the same access to communities with quality schools, banks, grocery stores, and other community staples, all of which stem from where they're able to work and live. Additionally, socioeconomically integrated uh, communities foster a greater sense of understanding and tolerance across people from different walks of lives and experiences. So to that end, I'm interested in exploring how AI as, as well as optimally designed subsidies can help improve socioeconomic integration. Uh, there are many possibilities on how to proceed. Uh, for example, one might decide to subsidize investments in communities that have historically suffered from redlining. But if those communities have subsequently gentrified, then blanket subsidies in those areas might not be justified. So a broader set of data would be needed. Or perhaps we should just acknowledge that there are many situations where there's an essential trade-off between fairness and profitability. And so we should explicitly subsidize lenders to adopt a more fair model while retaining the power of AI to identify the most promising loans to subsidize. Uh, for example, there's a program in Ottawa, Canada that's been using AI to I identify areas undergoing gentrification or disinvestment by analyzing home improvements that are visible by Google Earth and satellite images. So this sort of technology might be uh, showing uh, where we're gaining or losing socioeconomic integration and where subsidies might be appropriate. Um, so uh, I think, so my question is for, I guess, all of the witnesses here, if our goals are not only to eliminate unfairness going forward, but also to correct for past unfairness, what sort of uh, changes to the objective functions or explicit subsidies would we want uh, to optimize an AI program to measure and reward socioeconomic integration and other things that we're interested in promoting. You can take it in any order you want. Uh, well, I can I can kick it off. Um, one of the things that um, we have been championing, uh, Congressman Foster, is the building and, uh, and development of a publicly, a really robust publicly available data set uh, for research purposes uh, and to help fashion more uh, uh, tech that is more fair. Um, what we're finding is that a lot of a lot of discrimination and biases that we're seeing in AIs that we use, not just in financial services and housing, but in every area, uh, criminal justice, education, employment, et cetera, um, one of the challenges is that the data sets upon which the models are used are extremely flawed and insufficient. They are underrepresentative. Uh, and so if we can build more robust data sets, make them, we can even use synthetic data. So we don't have to use completely pure um, uh, original data that may raise privacy concerns. Um, but we, if, if we had more robust data sets, not only could we ensure that we're building better models that are less discriminatory um, uh, and that provide more socioeconomic benefits for uh, everyone in our society, but it would also give us better tools for a, um, a better foundation for um, diagnosing uh, different forms of discrimination and building more accurate tools for rooting out discrimina uh, discrimination in algorithmic-based systems. Yeah, well, thank you. Does anyone else want to take on the sort of optimal subsidy uh, part of the question? Congressman, uh, I, I'll say that uh, our experience working in emerging markets is that if you can provide some sort of credit enhancement uh, for lenders to incentivize them to lend into these subpopulations um, that are not well represented in the data, that you can both, um, you know, uh, give people a bridge to being scorable in the future uh, and also uh, incentivize uh, the creation of a more robust corpus of data that's truly representative of the ability and willingness of some of these uh, historically underprivileged communities uh, to pay back loans. So uh, I, I, I've uh, endorsed very much the comments Lisa made, and I think that we should look at credit enhancement programs for lenders uh, to incentivize exactly the kind of lending you're talk development you're talking about. 
Yeah, and you know, Kareem, Kareem's statement just reminded me that Canada has a program that does that. They actually subsidize on the insurance space uh, consumers who get declined from the voluntary market. Uh, and so there's a subsidy program to provide insurance for those consumers. And then it, it has actually helped build a more robust data set. And we can provide more information about that later. Yeah, thank you. I think this is a very important area to pursue to really use AI uh, to promote what we want instead of just uh, looking at it to you know, prevent it from acting badly. Um, so I will now recognize the ranking member for five minutes. Thank you, Chair, uh, Chair Foster. Um, Mr. Gerard, I want, I want to start with you. I, I, I find your, your testimony and your entire business model, frankly, to, to be uh, inspiring and, and interesting in, in so many ways. Um, but I, I, I'm curious as to how scalable the, the process was with the CFPB from the very beginning, um, because I think um, one concern I, I have is is that the CFPB or any other entity might not be able to handle, say, 100 companies trying to do sort of what, what you guys did. So um, I guess my first question would be, from a structure standpoint, how did you go about approaching the CFPB from the beginning? Because you sort of embedded compliance into the very beginning, which makes perfect sense. Um, but I'm, I'm curious sort of how, how that all played out, how that evolved, um, and, and whether or not you think whatever program you used could handle, let's say, 100 upstarts if, if we ever got to that point. So I'll just kind of turn it over to you to comment on that. Sure. Thank you, Congressman. Um, you know, first of all, I'll say one thing, uh, which is the Equal Credit Opportunity Act actually is, is, is quite useful. You might think of like old legislation from decades ago being irrelevant today or just not keeping up with the times, but it, it actually does in, in the largest sense. It, it works and it can be, can be implemented. But of course, there is some ambiguity uh, when you get into sort of algorithmic lending and such. So, you know, we went through, we, we introduced ourselves to the CFPB before we ever launched as a company because we were naive. People told us you shouldn't go talk to the regulators, just sort of hide out. And, and, and we didn't believe that was the right path. So we introduced ourselves, told them what we were hoping to achieve. And, you know, after years of good work, we got what is, you know, termed a no action letter, which basically means, you know, trying to, trying to provide some clarity where there's ambiguity in the regulation. That, of course, is not a scalable path for anybody. And we also necessarily took on a bit of risk in our early days because we didn't know what the outcomes of our models yeah. could be. But we were a startup. We, we were, had the capacity to take on that risk. So in reality, if, if there's going to be a path forward where these, these tools are broadly used and used in a responsible manner, uh, where they do, you know, sort of, they do not introduce bias, they do improve credit outcomes, it's going to require some form of legislation or rulemaking to standardize how testing is done. Uh, we've sort of done that one off, but it's really not scalable to the larger industry, which is, I think, what is necessary. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And, and uh, I'd love to follow up with you. We only have two and a half minutes left um, to get your ideas on what, what that might look like, because I think it's really important. Um, Ms. Cody, I want to move to you. Uh, we know that bank regulators are increasingly open to new kinds of underwriting as a driver for more inclusive lending and even for sounder lending. Uh, the agencies put out a joint statement on this. The CFPB provided the no action letter with Upstart, as, as we all know. Uh, what are the obstacles to industry adoption of these new models? Is it mostly regulatory risk or technological or cultural uh, or something else? And you know what else could be done to, to clear the obstacles? Yes, thank you for the question. Um, we have been quite focused um, in providing some of the empirical analysis on alternative financial data, cash flow information. And to clarify here, it is transaction data um, that you can see in a bank account and importantly, even a prepaid card transaction product, which we have greater coverage, especially among underserved communities and populations in terms of bank and prepaid access as compared to credit records and histories. Um, and that research, I think, helped to inform uh, the regulators' uh, awareness. I mean, they had been thinking about alternative data for a while as well, but nevertheless, providing that kind of research and empirical insight, I think, helped to inform the steps that the regulators took jointly to issue that statement. Um, there are, nevertheless, important questions around using new types of data in underwriting um, and more generally as well 
They extend from how are we ensuring consumer permissioned information is able to flow. Uh, we have 1033 under the Dodd-Frank Act for which we do not have rules written that would articulate that process um, and the, the, um, the data that would be then flowing under that authority. Um, we also have questions from, I think, uh, how adverse action notices are ultimately um, sufficiently responded to. Um, if you're going to be extending credit to somebody that is different from what they expected to receive or under different terms than they expected, you have to explain it. And I think articulating those explanations to consumers um, are areas that the industry is continuing to think about how do they uh, provide those kinds of explanations in a way that are uh, comfortable for consumers and responsive to at notice. Great. Thank you so much. And I yield back. No, thank you. And I will now recognize the chairwoman of the full committee, Ms. Waters, for five minutes. Thank you so very much. Uh, this will be directed to Ms. Rice and Mr. Hayes. The Equal Credit Opportunity Act and the Fair Housing Act prohibit discrimination for protected classes in the extension of credit and housing. Earlier this year, the Federal Reserve, the FDIC, the OCC, the NCUA, and the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau sent out a request to financial institutions and other stakeholders on how AI and ML are being used in the financial services space and how these activities conform with these laws. Additionally, the Federal Trade Commission issued a separate guidance that racial or gender bias in AI can prompt law enforcement action. Ms. Rice and Mr. Hayes, are these federal agencies doing enough to ensure that existing laws to prevent biases and discrimination are providing sufficient accountability for disparate impacts uh, that can result from the use of AI models? What should they be doing? Chairwoman, Chairwoman uh, Waters, thank you so much for the question. So one of the, we, the National Fair Housing Alliance has been working with all of those institutions at all of those federal agencies that you've just named on the issue of uh, AI fairness. And one of the challenges that we face is that um, the institutions themselves don't uh, necessarily have sufficient staff and resources in order to effectively uh, diagnose AI systems, detect discrimination, um, and um, uh, generate mechanisms and solutions for overcoming bias. So as an example, I mean, we've been using risk-based financial services institutions have been using credit scoring systems, automated underwriting systems, risk-based pricing systems for decades, right? And we, know, we are now finding out in part by using AI tools that these systems have been generating bias for, for decades and decades. But for all of these years, the financial regulators were really not able to detect the deep level of bias ingrained in these systems. So we really have to support the federal regulatory agencies, make sure they're educated, make sure they're well equipped so that they can do an efficient uh, job, uh, not only working with financial services institutions, but also um, to make their systems more fair, well, but also well, in working with- Let me interrupt you here for a minute, for, uh, 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 Ms. Rice and Mr. Hayes. We would like this information brought to us uh, because when we talk about the long-standing biases, we should be on top of fighting for resources and insisting that the agencies have what they need to deal with it. And because they're embedded now, it is because we have not done everything we could do to make sure that they were equipped uh, to do what they needed to do uh, to avoid and to get rid of these biases. So we want the information. We want you guys to bring the information to us so that we can now legislate and we can go after the funds that are needed. And so I thank you for, you know, continuing to work on these issues, but I want you guys to bring that information to us so we can do some legislation. Mr. Hayes, do you have anything else to add to this? Uh, I completely agree with Lisa. I am hearing what you're saying, and I think that's a great idea. I, I will say the agencies um, have been in learning mode for a few years, and now it is actually time 
to provide some more guidance on how you should test AI models. I think industry is ready for that. We're ready for that. We'd like to help inform that process. But I do think now is some time for some more generally applicable guidance and action in this space. Well, I think that Mr. Foster would welcome uh, additional information. Other members of Congress, including I, the chair of the this uh, Financial Services Committee, uh, because we cannot allow us to wait, 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 and tell the agencies to do better. We've got to force better. And so enforcing better, that means that we understand where the biases are and we actually legislate and we tell the agencies what they've got to do. So I'm so pleased about this hearing today. I'm so pleased about the leadership of Mr. Foster, but now this is a moment in history for us to deal with getting rid of discrimination and biases in lending and housing and all of this. And so help us, help us out. Don't just go to them, come to us and tell us what we need to do. Is that okay? Thank you very much. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairwoman. And um, and I, I just wanted to say that if any of the members or the witnesses are interested in sort of hanging around informally after the close of the hearing, it's something that we often do in, in person hearings and we're happy to uh, try to duplicate that in the online era here. And the chair will now recognize uh, uh, the representative from Georgia, Mr. Laudermilk for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I appreciate uh, having another very intriguing uh, uh, hearing on a very important matter here, especially as we adopt uh, newer technologies in the financial services uh, sector. Now, last year, the FDIC issued a request for information regarding standard settings and voluntary certification for technology providers. The idea is to have a voluntary certification program to streamline the process for banks and credit unions to partner with third-party fintech and AI providers. The proposal is intriguing to me because when I met with both financial institutions and technology providers, one of their biggest concerns with the current regulatory requirements is that it takes an enormous amount of time and due diligence every time they want to form a partnership. I believe streamlining the onboarding process is an important step toward encouraging these type of partnerships. So my question for Mr. Gerard, uh, what are your thoughts on this issue? Yeah, th this is a really important issue. You know, we tend to serve community banks, uh, smaller banks who, you know, are often struggling to compete with the larger banks that have a lot more technical resources and, and people that they can put against the diligence they're required to do to use any type of third party technology in their business. and. You know, if you're um, if you're Wells Fargo or or Chase or PNC, you you ha you can spend all day and, and and millions of dollars evaluating technology solutions. If you're a community bank, um, that's not possible. So, right. I, I think if you want to even the playing field, if you want to keep the smaller banks alive, valid in the communities they serve, you need to make it easier for them to adopt technology. And that doesn't mean sort of foregoing the evaluations or the, or the prudence that you need to responsibly adopt it. It just means allowing them to essentially put their efforts together to some sort of standard that would allow small banks across the country to keep up with all the investment going on in the, in the top handful of banks out there. So if we were able to streamline uh, the ability to form these partnerships, would that benefit consumers by expanding the fintech and AI products? Oh, for sure. I mean, every month or so, we turn on another community bank who suddenly offers, you know, attractive price products with higher approval rates, lower interest rates in their communities, and it's happening regularly. But, but honestly, we're just—it's just the—it's just, just the tip of the iceberg. The opportunity is, is is so much larger, and you know, most banks, frankly, just don't have the time and resources. This is a process that can take six months. Uh, you can go through, you know, hundreds of hours of meetings and discussions. You have your regulator come in and you talk to whether it's FDIC, OCC, et cetera. So there's just this incredible process that most banks just don't have the time and resources to take on. So it just gets sidelined. On another topic that I've brought up in these hearings before is dealing with the issue of bias. And, you know, we need to recognize the difference between what types of bias we want uh, to have an AI versus those that need to be rooted out. Obviously, you have to have a level of bias to discriminate against those who can and cannot pay a loan back 
I mean, not all types of bias are bad. If you think about it, the whole purpose of using AI and loan underwriting is to be biased against those who are unable to repay a loan, um, or at least identify those that you know uh, have uh, the data set that would say these folks are unlikely to pay a loan, and or, or even just to set an interest rate. Um, at the same time, algorithms obviously should not contain bias that is based on factors that are irrelevant to the actual credit worthiness of the borrower, like race or gender or any other factor. Mr. George, do you agree that we need to be careful not to eliminate all bias in AI, but rather we should be working to eliminate the types of bias that really don't belong there? Uh, well, Congressman, it, perhaps it's a bit of semantics, but we believe bias is always wrong. Accuracy in a credit model is what we seek. And giving a loan to somebody who's going to fail to pay it back is not doing any good for them. So, of course, wanting to lend to people who have the capacity to pay it back is always our goal. But we don't view an accurate credit model or making offers of credit as as, as good as possible for people who are likely to pay it back in any sense bias against everybody else it's really just accuracy uh in predicting and understanding who has the capacity to repay and, and maybe it is semantics but what we're looking at is is for ai to look at data just just hard data irregardless or regardless i should say of of any other demographic factor just looking at the creditability of the 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 borrower and uh, you know, I see that in a technical term as a level of bias, just to be able to determine, is this person able to uh, pay back the loan in the amount that they're borrowing, um, or are they not? Set all that other stuff aside, that's really what we want AI to be able to do, not, not look at race or gender or any of those factors, just are they of the income level, are they, do they have a credit history, um, do they have a history of paying back loans, et cetera? That's really what we're trying to get to. Is that correct? It, it, it's true that we are trying to have an accurate model that will lend to people that can pay it back. And, and we constantly strive to make our model more accurate because when we do that, it tends to approve more people at lower rates and it actually disproportionately approves more underserved people, Black Americans, the Hispanic community. Um, so that's all good. But having said that, we are thorough believers that you need a supervisory system, a separate system that watches and it makes sure you're not introducing bias. And I agree, and I appreciate you uh, your answer, and I yield back. Thank you. And the chair will now recognize the gentlewoman from Massachusetts, Ms. Presley, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for convening this task force hearing and to each of our witnesses for their testimony. Last year, I had the opportunity to ask the former CFPB director about a practice that remains of serious concern to me. The use of information about people's education, including where they went to college when making decisions about access to credit and the cost of credit. An investigation by Consumer Advocates showed that the artificial intelligence lending company Upstart was charging customers who went to historically black colleges more money for student loans than customers who went to other schools, holding all else equal. Now, I know Upstart has vigorously denied these allegations, but I have here the first report prepared by Mr. Hayes and his colleagues as a part of a settlement the company reached with the NAACP Legal Defense Fund and the Student Borrower Protection Center. On page 23, it appears to say that Upstart made significant changes to its business model after coming under fire for its lending practices. I'll certainly be watching closely to see if Mr. Hayes' firm can independently verify that these changes actually address the disturbing effects of Upstart's approach to lending. It's hard to imagine a practice that better illustrates the deep and lasting legacy of systemic racism in American higher education than educational redlining. That's why I was so troubled to see that yet another fintech lender that uses AI, a company called Stride Funding, was engaged in what sounds like the very same discriminatory practices as Upstart. Mr. Hayes, should we be worried that these practices are driving racial inequality and leading to disparate outcomes for former students? Thank you, Representative. Um, well, I'll say as a general matter, every time you use data, in a model, part of the reason using that data is to replicate some patterns in that data. Um, 
And we also know that there are disparities in our education system, as you pointed out. There are disparities with respect to race, national origin, and uh, sex. Those could be replicated if you use that data in a model. That's a risk. It's not inevitable. There are lots of ways to use data to design models so that you don't do that. Our role in the Upstart and um, Student Bar Production Center matters as an independent monitor. And so I don't have views at this point about um, whether that has happened, whether those reports are accurate or not. That is part of our charge as an independent monitor. I think it's a risk. It's one that should be guarded against. And I think any company that uses this type of data should be very careful with it and, and test its intuition. Okay, so Mr. Hayes, how can Congress and financial regulators ensure that complex algorithms and machine learning aren't just being used to obscure the disparate and illegal impact of these lending practices? What can we do? That's a great question. I will say, as an initial matter, there's a wide variation in AI ML models, and some of them are quite difficult to explain or maybe impossible to explain. Others are not, um, others are explainable. And I would say as an initial matter, if an institution cannot explain its model, why it's reaching certain conclusions, it should be very hesitant or maybe not use it at all for important decisions. I think that's pretty key. This goes also back to the point that um, Chairwoman Waters had made. I think it is a great opportunity for the CFPB to come in and start actively testing some of these models to, to test some of these intuitions, to test whether these risks are real. Um, that's a role that it can play. As an outside advocate, there's only so much you can do with the model. It takes an agency with supervisory authority to really help institutions understand how their models work and make sure that they're not going to violate the law. All right, thank you. I mean, these patterns are certainly uh, very disturbing. It seems that um, people have not learned from Upstart's errors. Uh, the discrimination against students who have gone to HBCUs and um, minority serving institutions exacerbates the disproportionate burden of student loans on black Americans and perpetuates economic discrimination. If the use of AI and lending is to continue and expand in the financial services sector, Congress and federal regulators must be positioned to provide proper oversight. Uh, and as I mentioned, I'll be watching closely. Thank you, I yield. Thank you. And the chair will now recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Taylor, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's great to be on the task force and uh, appreciate the opportunity for this hearing. Uh, since upstart, I think uh, Ms. Presley, and I certainly hope you won't discriminate against me for having gone to college and business school in your district. Uh, I, since upstart has been uh, named here, would love to uh, give uh, the CEO an opportunity to respond to that uh, question set. Sure, thank you. And, and Congresswoman, I certainly appreciate your concern, but uh, I will say, uh, first and foremost, I have dedicated my career to improving access to credit. And uh, I stand proud with what we have accomplished and how we have done it. Um, the use of education data without question uh, improves access to credit for Black Americans, for Hispanic Americans, um, for almost any demographic you, you can speak to. Um, our models aren't perfect, but they certainly are not discriminatory. Um, we certainly had a disagreement with the student borrower protection uh, a, a group and um, their conclusions in our view were inaccurate. Having said that, we very uh, willfully began to work with them um, and to engage with them and to figure out, are there ways we can make even more improvements to our testing and to our methodology? Um, uh, and we've uh, continued to do that, as well as the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. So I think Upstart has demonstrated good faith in trying to improve credit access for all uh, and to do it in a fair way that is working proactively with regulators, is here working with, with lawmakers, and will work with consumer advocates if they want to. We have nothing to hide, and, and frankly, we are, we are proud of the effort we're making to improve access to credit for Americans. Ms. Presley, do you want to ask a follow-up? I'd be happy to yield the floor to you to ask a follow-up with Mr. Gerard, or I can continue on my questioning. Okay. Uh, so, Mr. Gerard, uh, I really appreciate what you're doing. I, I think uh, you have an impressive model, and it's 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 amazing to see the application of AI and the way that you've done it. Um, 
can you, how do you source your loans? Are you doing those directly or are you doing those through, through traditional banking platforms? So um, borrowers come either to Upstart at, through our brand and recognizing our marketing efforts to say, come here and you can get a better loan than you could get elsewhere. They can also come directly through our bank partners. There's more than 15 banks on our platform who also can offer the, um, use on, using our technology, offer loans to their own customers. So they can find us in, in many different ways, and um, and and how, how big how big how big are those how big are those bank your fifteen banking partners are those kind of regional banks or those you know G subs or those community banks? They vary from community banks. There's also I should add credit unions, and credit unions um, are uh, on our platform is growing quite quickly. Is and what's your what's your what's your what's your average loan size? Uh, in the range of ten to twelve thousand dollars. Okay. And I will say in your, in your testimony, and I, I'll just I want to put this card on the table. I was on a bank board for 12 years uh, and I sat on loan committee. And so, you know, was you know part of approving every loan for 12 years. I, I can honestly say never once did credit score was credit score determinative of a loan. Uh, and per be per very honest in the director discussions, I would say that credit score didn't come up in 95% of our loan decisions. Uh, so I just, the, the statement that you made about it being a primary means of, of making credit decisions, I, I just at least was antithetical to my own limited experience at, at one of the 5,000 banks in the United States, uh, you know, in terms of how we thought about credit. Um, I, but I will say that I haven't, I've, I've yet to meet a bank that doesn't have a minimum credit score requirement for a loan, typically 680 or something of that nature. So if, if they're out there, ha haven't met them yet. Oh, okay. That's, I, I, I see where you're coming from, but I, again, I would just okay. I, I think I understand what you're saying. Thank, thank, thank you for that. That actually kind of clarifies where you're where you're coming from in that particular in that particular assessment. But what, again, I would just say that you know, again, underwriting credit is very important. I think that you want to get it, and the other thing is you want to have costs be lower. The other, the final thing I would say, if I add a whole bunch of regulations on you, I Congress. Doesn't that make it more expensive for you to do business and then in turn force you to raise your rates? It, it depends what that regulation is. A lot of times regulation can be clarity that actually helps adoption of a technology move more. If I make it more expensive for you to operate, doesn't that increase the cost of operating? Oh, by definition, it, it for sure does, Congressman. Okay. Thank you. So I, I just encourage my, my colleagues as we think about this, make sure we don't increase the cost of operating and then in turn, lower access to capital, which I think is all our mutual objective. I yield back. Thank you. And the chair will now recognize the gentleman from North Carolina, Ms. Adams, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Thank you for calling the meeting. And Madam Chair, uh, uh, we appreciate uh, your support as well. Uh, and to the witnesses, thank you for offering your expertise and, and your insight. Um, I, I'm uh, grateful to Representative Presley for diving into educational redlining it, it, and its harmful impacts on HBCU students and graduates. Uh, over the past year, we've seen examples of how using such data and algorithms uh, by lenders could result in borrowers facing thousands of dollars in additional charges if they attended a minority serving institution institution like a historically black college or university. Uh, I'm a proud product of an HBCU two-time graduate of North Carolina A&T, a 40-year a professor at Bank College, also an HBCU. And I do know how invaluable uh, these schools have been to my success and, and their outsized role in the economic and social mobility of millions of black people in this country. Uh, they play a critical role in diversifying the workforce, particularly the tech sector. Uh, Ms. Rice and uh, Mr. Uh, Soleil, uh, we know that AI bias is real. Uh, can you speak to the importance and value of increasing the diversity among AI researchers, scientists, and developers to improve quality of algorithm development and data sets? And how can we ensure that HBCUs uh, play a greater role in diversifying the AI pipeline? I'll let my con <laughs> Congresswoman Adams, thank you so much for that um, question. Is it critically important? Um, I mentioned earlier that the National Fair Housing Alliance has launched a tech equity initiative 
one of the major goals of the tech equity initiative is to increase diversity in the tech field. And uh, one of the ways of doing that, of course, is, as you've just mentioned, is partnering with uh, BIPOC serving financial institutions and HBCUs. Um, I, I hinted in my, my statement that um, we have found, and, and the National Fair Housing Alliance has been working on tech bias issues since our inception almost 40 years ago. So these issues, tech bias, AI, AI uh, algorithmic bias is not new. It's just, you know, gaining more media attention. But we have found that as we work with financial services institutions on the issue of tech bias, and we've been doing this again for almost 40 years, the more these financial services institutions, lenders, insurance companies, et cetera, as they diversify their employee base, they yield better policies that are more inclusive and fair, and they also themselves design better systems that are not only more accurate, but have uh, less discriminatory outcomes. And oftentimes it's because those, um, those people of color who are working inside those institutions, they can see signs of discrimination. They can pick up on variables that are being used in the algorithm uh, and from their own personal experience can detect and, and sort of understand how those variables can generate a discriminatory outcome. I, I mentioned that a lot of uh, the innovations that we're seeing in the AI field, uh, you know, a lot of the, 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 the tech bias that ha has been uh, uh, documented has come from uh, scientists like Joy Buolamwini, who is you know, one of the most noted uh, data scientists in the world. How did she detect that facial recognition uh, systems were discriminatory? Because she was working on a project and facial recognition technology did not work for her black face. Right. If okay. she had been black, she, black, she wouldn't have noticed that. So I yield mm -hmm. to my my colleague, Mr. Salah. Mr. Salah, I, I don't have uh, much to add to Lisa's excellent comments, uh, Congresswoman. You're absolutely right. We must do more to diversify uh, the. Um, uh, the population of people who are building AI systems, governing AI systems, monitoring AI systems. Uh, we have not, the technology industry has not been sufficiently good in that regard. Uh, that we must improve. We, we can do better. Uh, tenant screening uh, algorithms have been increasingly employed by landlords, but there's evidence that these algorithms adversely affect Black and Latino renters. Uh, for example, when a Navy veteran named uh, Marco uh, uh, Fernandez returned from deployment trying to rent a house, a tenant screening algorithm computer. I'm going to have to yield back, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, thank you so very much, and thank you to uh, our uh, 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 guests for, for your responses. Well, thank you. And the chair will recognize the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Hollingsworth, for five minutes. Well, I appreciate the chair and certainly appreciate the ranking member for having this great hearing today and talking about these very important topics. I certainly uh, welcome and hope for more diversity, more diversity in the technology field writ large and find more opportunities for more people to contribute their great talents to this country. I think that's what has been a made us a leader around the world in technology, and I hope it is what will continue to make us a leader of technology around the world. Mr. Gerard, I wanted to talk a little bit about this for a second. I certainly know that you're a fan of making sure that your workforces and other workforces are very diverse, but I also want to recognize the desire that you have for ensuring that your platform isn't biased in some way, that you make money by making loans. And if you can find more credit worthy individuals, no matter what walk of life they may come from, no matter what color their skin, no matter what background they may have, than other potential technologies, then you're better off because of that. Wouldn't you say that you're, in, you're incentivized to make sure that you find as many opportunities to make credit worthy loans as possible? Yes, absolutely. I mean, the, the way my company grows is the AI models get smarter at identifying who will and won't pay a loan. 
and, and that might seem odd, you might think that could make you shrink, not grow. But, but, but in reality, millions and millions of people who are actually credit worthy in reality are not recognized as such by a credit score. And that, the, that little oddness there means the better our models get on balance, the more people get approved and the lower the interest rates are. So it's a, it's a, it's a sort of win for everybody as long as the technology keeps improving. And, and thus far, it's, it's, it's worked well for us. And I definitely want to get back to how do we keep improving the technology, but I just want to hit this point once again, because I think frequently it goes unsaid, but that is that the wind is at your back. The goal is to increase the number of loans and frankly, to find opportunities to make loans where others might not be able to make those loans or may not find that same opportunity. So it is not as though we are struggling to hold back uh, a problem, but instead the problem resolution and the market incentive here are working in the same direction. And I think that's really important for us to remember um, because in many other places they work in opposite directions. Secondarily, I want to come back to exactly what you said, which is how do we improve this technology over time? How do we expand the breadth of this technology over time? And I wondered if you might have, whether there are stories or narratives or specific points as to how we might do that, how we as policymakers might empower you, your cohorts, your colleagues, your counterparts, and frankly, the next generation of yous to develop this technology and be able to make it mainstream so that we can empower more Americans, no matter the color of their skin, no matter the background, to be able to get access to financial capital. Yeah, I mean, first, thank you for the question, Congressman. I think, first of all, one of the most important things that could happen is just to provide clarity. Um, we're all for testing, as you can see. We, we believe we're leading the charge on how rigorous uh, testing for bias can be and should be. And, you know, as much as it probably to our benefit that no one else figured out how to do it and, and deploy this technology, but it's to the, to the country's benefit that there's as much of this used responsibly as possible. And I think that is gonna require, you know, the problem of course is banks are um, regulated not by one agency, but by at least four, if not more than that. And if you add state, state level regulators as well. So it is really difficult for technology like this to get a hold when even within one regulator, there's not a consistent opinion. A, a supervisor of this bank might say one thing, a supervisor of another bank says another thing. So the, the adoption rate ends up being very slow. This is another really important matter I wanna raise, which is banks have to worry about consumer you know, protection, et cetera. But in the other side, they have the bank um, solvency, the sort of bank, um, the people who are caring about whether the bank is gonna go out of business. And these are sometimes at odds because they are prevented from making loans to what you would perceive, what, what, what the regulator would perceive as risky borrowers. So you have this sort of governance right. of banks that is oftentimes in conflict with moving toward a more equitable, more inclusive lending program. And that is really, that's difficult. Well, because Mr. Zerka, I think, yeah. I, yeah, I think that's a great point and something we really need to hit home. What you're saying is we care about the solvency of our financial markets, the safety, but we also care about the efficiency and making sure we don't push one too far in favor of the other is a really important dynamic going forward. And I think Van Taylor hit on this, but regulation can both help efficiency, but it can also hurt efficiency greatly and making sure we monitor that's very important. I'll yield back to the chair. Thank you. And the chair will now recognize the gentleman from Massachusetts for five minutes. Thanks, Mr. Chair, for organizing this and for our witnesses for their terrific uh, testimony and Q&A. Uh, Massachusetts has been really on the cutting edge of artificial intelligence and its use in computational biology, in insurance, and in the provision of legal services, uh, in investing in real estate, uh, and also in thinking about the regulatory dimensions. The Massachusetts State House has formed a facial recognition commission led by uh, State Senator Cindy Cream in, in my district because of concerns over facial recognition applications. Uh, a study from MIT in 2018 found that while accuracy rates for white men were north of 99% with facial recognition technology for black women, it was significantly less so. And Ms. Rice, this is why I was very happy to hear you raise this, this issue. Um, I was wondering if I could really bring up two questions with you. The first is, 
concerns you may have or proposed regulations for the introduction of facial recognition technology into the setting of, of housing. We're seeing already that smart home technology like Latch or, or uh, smart keypads and nests are really becoming standard fare. And I don't think it's very far behind to have uh, cameras that are linked up for recognition as well. Has this, has this been an area that you've looked at in, in regards to housing and uh, are there safeguards in place? Yes, Congressman, thank you for the question. And uh, we have in one other area uh, that we've particularly been uh, focusing on is the use of facial, facial recogn recognition technology in um, the area of financial services. So, for example, you know, more transactions have been happening in the virtual space. And um, there certainly is the opportunity to use facial recognition technology um, as a fraud detection mechanism, for example. So yes, this is an area of deep uh, and grave concern. It's, it's one of the reasons why we've been calling for the building and development of more inclusive, uh, robust data sets in, in many different areas. One of the, the ways that uh, Joy Bualamwini and, and other data scientists were able to work with IBM and Google and Facebook, et cetera, to help them improve or lessen the discrimination on their systems was by uh, building better training data sets. That was actually the second point I wanted to raise. I heard you've been ahead of me this whole hearing. You had mentioned earlier in your comments the idea of synthetic data as a way to, as a way to uh, buttress training sets. My understanding for how the original facial recognition training sets were composed is that they were the faces were really scraped off of a lot of social media sites and elsewhere, and were pulling it seems like disproportionately white faces. Has there been work done to and maybe just describe more? how that, those training sets have been fixed. Because as you say, the data really, the, the raw data is, is the core of, of undoing bias and the actual outcomes. Yes, and to be more specific, I, I should have been more specific. I was um, um, sort of myopically focused on financial and housing services uh, in, in, in terms of my reference to a synthetic uh, data set, publicly available data set for research and education only. I don't think we should be building real systems and models using a lot of synthetic data. So I, I'm sorry, I didn't get a chance to make that distinction. Absolutely. Uh, Ms. Ms. Coity, maybe you could weigh in here as well about uh, any oversight that you think is necessary for federal uh, for facial recognition technology. I think you're muted. Sorry about that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the question. We've been much more focused on tabular data, uh, data that is being contemplated or used in credit underwriting. We have not been evaluating facial recognition data, but it's a great question. Understood. Uh, yeah, it's an area that I that I we've been leaning into in Massachusetts, and I think increasingly nationally, just because it's. Uh, in some ways, the technology is both really good and really bad, really good in the sense that it's been incredibly effective and had created some kind of uh, really compelling results in its accuracy, but very bad in the sense that this kind of biases have snuck through in a way that, um, as, as Ms. Rice pointed out, were not identified for too long. So uh, it's been an area of concern for me, uh, both at the state and the federal level. Uh, and I'll yield back the balance of my time, Mr. Chair. Well, thank you. And I'd like to thank all of our witnesses for their testimony today. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit additional written questions for the witnesses to the chair and which will be forwarded to the witnesses for their response. I also ask our witnesses to please respond as promptly as you're able. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days with which to submit extraneous materials to the chair for inclusion in the record. I remind members that their written questions and materials for the record should be submitted uh, to the email addresses provided to your offices. Uh, this hearing is now adjourned.